Uh, no 4-2 is not readable. I just got done saying that. All right, so I'm going to jump to that place in memory and set a breakpoint. If all goes well, when the application crashes, we'll stop at that breakpoint. I need more overweight people to ask questions, by the way. <laughs> Even Adam, go out there and see if there's any leftovers. <laughs> All right, so make sure it's running over here. Our program is running. We have our breakpoint set. It sends the crash. You can't see it down here very well, but it says breakpoint at user 32 and our memory address, which means the application has stopped at our memory address. Let's step through that, and there we are. We're at the beginning. I think it should be, yeah. If we go scroll up here, you'll see there's the last instruction it ran, and there's our payload. It dropped us right at the beginning of our Cs, which is awesome because that means we don't have to do a dollop slide. Right before that, right next to it, actually it says uh, 70. Is that? It's hard to read. Is that CC? Oh, these CCs here? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, well, actually, right above that, like. Uh, okay. okay. Now, what you're seeing here, so you're right. actually seeing. Yeah. Hold on a second. Let me scroll back. Is that the machine code for junk? No, that is actually not. It, it is, but that's not why it's there. That is. Um, yeah. The jump address. That is where we told it to read. So you've got. This is the packet that came in. You know, we sent a bunch of A's, then we sent where we wanted it to go, and then it drops us into our C's. So, and it's actually, I changed it at some point. Like when I, I did this over several days, it went from being the character for C's to this CC, which is a breakpoint. Um, but regardless, what you're seeing here, this uh, 53984270E, if you go back and look, that was the address that we put in back here in little Indian style, so, yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. How did you get to the, uh, how did you get to the jump? I know you told it to go into user 32 mm -hmm. at that particular spot. Okay. And execute that command. How did you tell it to get to user 32? Okay. It, because user 32 resides in that part of memory, I gave it an address. I didn't so much tell it to go into user 32, find this part. Yes. I said, go to this address in memory. And okay. that was where user 32 resided, and that's where that command existed. So, so you did that by setting the instruction pointer to... I set my return address. Return address. The, okay. the return address, which is what EIP reads, okay. to go to that address, which is what I set in the exploit. Okay, so it, the program issued the, the red command and grabbed that address. You. Yeah, it's what I provided right there. That's the address that I provided, and I copied this up here. So here's the address. There's the uh, command that equals jump ESP residing in user 32 DLL. Okay. And so um, that was and the you last saw how I found it. Yes. You want to go over that again? or was oh, that? No, that's okay. That was the last of the A's that you sent in, right? Yeah, so it's 256 A's. A's. My return address, which is that address that which jumps you over to them. that address, which then calls it jumps to whichever address is in ESP, which is this address right here, which is the beginning of our uh, theoretic the, shell code. The payload will be in the payload. I'm about to replace all these with this the with a payload. Got you. ESP yeah. is execution stack pointer. No, it's. Uh, Ex, uh, extended Extend. stack pointer. Extended stack pointer. Yeah, the E and all that stands for extended. It's when it, it's for 32 bit addressing. Okay. Yeah. Do you know any, so, I said, do you know the good debugger for 64 bit applications? I, I debug is not. I have not messed with it. What's that? 64 bit debugging. Well, when debugs it. Yeah, I don't know. I I don't do anything with 64 bit stuff. I'm still pretty new at this kind of stuff. So. You're doing good. <laughs> What's up, John? I was going to say, um, all your seeds, those are blowing out of other things on the stack, right? Yeah. So there's a good chance you just you know, crash the OS at this point? No, not the OS, but the application for sure. The application. Yeah, the application is is going to fail hard here in a second. Now, if I was uh, if I was good at this, 
I would be able to write an exploit that then fixed all the stack, and the application would keep running, but I'd still get my shell. But I'm not that good at it yet. And that takes a lot of work. <laughs> so let's, let's go back and see how far off I am in this. Um, I, it, I had played with it, and uh, it's actually a pretty limited amount of space there, and 250 worked. Um, I started with 300, and it wouldn't crash quite properly. Crashes are really sensitive to the sizing, so um, there is some behind the scenes of me playing with this uh, that you just learn as you go through. If the program, if you know the program's going to crash, but like in this example, especially dealing with UDP, um, I don't know where it crashed. The thing is sending it so many packets so fast, I don't know if it crashed at 300, 500, 700, because by the time I am looking at it, and I see 100, 200, 300 days going to it, and I go over to see when the program's crashed and come back, it's at 1,000, 1,100, 1,200. I just have to kind of start making guesses on where it crashed, and I can increase that space. You start with a smaller amount of space, and you can increase it. Uh, it stopped crashing after roughly 250 bytes in the shell code, which is pretty limited but it was still good enough to do this demonstration with it. Um, so here, now we're going to add a shell code. This is what actually does something. We have the program, we have a crash, and we have it going to the right place we want it to go to. Now we want to make it do something we want it to do. We want to add a user, we want to pop shell, uh, add an interpreter. In this case, because we're so limited for the uh, space, I'm just going to launch calc.exe. That's usually enough to do a proof of concept, um, show somebody, hey, you've got a problem in your application. You had TFTP server running, now you have calc running. Something's wrong here, guys. Um, so that's, a, that's what we're going to add to it this time. Back to that. Uh, it's really easy to do. So normally, uh, what I've been doing in the past, and this is actually one of my first exploits I've done in Metasploit. I usually write them in uh, Python. Uh, you would have to come back. You use Metasploit a lot. You use the... Uh, the generator for uh, generating the, the strings, the offset strings. Um, you also use it to generate your payloads. Uh, so instead of generating a payload and having to copy and paste it and make sure everything makes it over okay, uh, you replace one line. In this case, we replace this XC times 50 or 250 with payload.encode. And that's it. So then you go into your application. So you guys all know what I'm doing here. If you have any questions about what I'm typing in, what I'm typing in, please stop me. So, there it is. I'm going to restart the application in the debugger. Start it. Jump to that address in memory. Reset my breakpoint. All right, breakpoint set. I think I've got everything set here. The God smile on me. We will hit our breakpoint. So I don't really want to step through the shell code line by line. Uh, I just want to hit play, and I want to see calc. That's how I know my exploit worked. So there's that, and we can pull it out of the debugger and watch it happen in real time-ish as I have to go back and forth. See, by the time I even go back to it, it's run. The program's crashed, but I have calc. In theory. If it wasn't such a limited space and or through advanced exploitation techniques such as egg hunters, which are really cool, uh, you get a little bit of code that then goes and looks through memory in places where the exploit wouldn't overwrite. Like, let's say we send another command that's not necessarily going to overwrite the buffer, but we'll still place it in memory. If we put a phrase at the beginning, um, we can take this little 32-byte shell code. That was probably about 250 bytes of shell code. We can take 32 bytes of just ridiculously small, and it'll go through page by page by page of memory looking for that phrase, and when it finds it, it executes everything behind it, which is really, really cool stuff. It's, 
It's a little bit more advanced than what uh, 